Welcome to the Three Principles Global Community webinar. The Three Principles Global Community, 3PGC, is a non-profit organisation committed to bringing an understanding of the three principles as introduced by Sydney Banks to people throughout the world. Our guest speaker today is Hana Studley. Hana is a mind, body and wellness coach. In the early 1980s, she survived three violent muggings, resulting in a broken neck, a fractured skull and herniated discs. This was followed by 10 years of post-traumatic stress disorder and 25 years of chronic pain. Despite this, Hana went on to have a very successful career in the entertainment business, first in London theatre and then in Los Angeles, working in special effects for Hollywood movies. In 1994, she won an Academy Award as part of the team for the movie Babe, which was filmed here in Australia. <laughs> it's a great movie. Alongside this very successful career, Hannah trained as a coach and counsellor, using her experience of surviving trauma to help others do the same. In between projects, she continued to work with people with trauma, addictions, relationship problems and anxiety for the next 30 years. After graduating from the One Thought Institute in 2018, she realised that her chronic back pain, IBS and menopause symptoms had gone away. Since then, she's been leading the way in pioneering work with the mind-body connection and the three principles. Most recently, she's been working with people with long COVID and hormone distress. Hana is a World Health Organization psychological first responder she has a diploma in psychology, a diploma in menopause awareness, and is a certified life coach. She's also a successful author. And I recommend you read her books, which I have done. This evening, Hana will be speaking about exploring the mind-body connection from an understanding of the three principles. Welcome, Hana. Wow, thank you so much, Justine. That was such a nice introduction. Thank you. So welcome, everybody. It's so nice we've got um, people from all over the world here on, on the webcast. That's uh, it's really nice. It's such a, a, a wonderful community that we have here. So welcome. And I, as I was listening to that introduction, um, I just was reminded of a question I get asked a lot, which is how did I go from, you know, working in special effects in big Hollywood movies to coaching people with chronic pain. So um, my cute answer is that um, my job in Hollywood was in special effects. I was known for making copies of real animals. They're called animatronics. So if a, a story had a, an animal that talks, then we'd make a copy of exactly that animal and, and you wouldn't be able to know the difference between the real animal and my puppet. Um, and that world of special effects is all about convincing you that things are true or real that aren't, you know, like the animals can talk, for example, right? And our minds um, have a better special effects department than anything me or Steven Spielberg could come up with. You know, I don't know about you guys, but my, my mind has convinced me of things at times that they're real when really they are not. <laughs> You know, whether it's a, you know, a weird sound coming from somewhere or, um, you know, a truth about somebody else or myself that just is, isn't true. It's like based in the, in the, some kind of um, illusion. And I think that's one of the, um, one of the many um, benefits and, and blessings I've gotten from understanding the three principles is to see through the illusions of my thinking. And to tie that in with the mind-body um, connection, I see pain, and when I say pain, that includes dizziness and nausea and all, all, all the physical things we can experience. I see that now as, as the ultimate special effect because pain really has no substance. And anything I can tell you now about pain and, and medical stuff, like I am not a doctor, as, as my bio kind of clearly demonstrated. I, I have other skills, but I am not medically trained. So everything I know, has come from my own experience and from doing a lot of reading and research and being mentored by Dr. Bill Pettit for you know, many years now. Um, I've gained so much from his, his wisdom. And what I see is um, uh, the pain and, and physical issues are our body's way of communicating with us. 
So for example, um, I was coaching uh, a 12 year old boy recently. Um, he was having difficulties in the classroom and his parents wanted me to <clears throat> help him with um, just, just understanding a little bit about how experience is created. So, you know, when you're talking to a child, you have to kind of use different, um, different analogies and di different ways of explaining things. And I was asking, I wanted, to, I wanted him to see how it felt in his body when he started to get agitated and upset. So um, I asked him a few questions. I said, what does it feel like when, when you're hungry? Like in the middle of the day at school, they have a break. What, what's that break for? So he pointed at his stomach and he goes, well, my tummy rumbles. And I said, yeah, exactly. Um, it doesn't mean that you're dying, right? It just means you need to eat. That's a message that your, your tummy is sending you. And then, for example, when you're running around playing football and, and you get hot, what, what happens? He said, said um he says start sweating i said right it doesn't mean you're leaking right it just means that you're hot and your body is trying to cool you down and then i said what about at night time when you're tired and it's time to go to bed um do your eyelids get heavy he goes yeah it's really annoying <laughs> i said well that's your body telling you that you need to go to sleep they're all messages they're not right or wrong. They're just useful information. It's the way our mind and our bodies work together to give us information to help us survive and eat and take care of ourselves. So then I asked him, what, what does it feel like when you get anxious? What does it feel like when you get irritated or frustrated with other people? And he went like this. And I think a lot of people feel it here in their chest or their throat. Some people feel it in their stomachs, some people in their arms. Um, I always used to feel it in the back of my skull, like um, apparently there are muscles in the back of the skull here and it would get very tight in my neck and my shoulders. Now, when I used to go to doctors and chiropractors and osteopaths with all my chronic pain and I would tell them, you know, I had this tension in my shoulders and my stomach's acting up and my back is killing me. I mean, I was in such pain that I, I had a walking stick by the time I was 27. I was bent sideways and forward. I often couldn't stand up straight. Several times I was paralyzed from the chest down. And whenever I would explain my medical history to the doctors, like um, Justine read out, I had a lot of serious injuries from those um, violent attacks. And they would say, well, that's why you're in so much pain. Like for example, I'd wake up with my arm numb and they'd say, well, the nerve for your arm comes out of your neck and your neck was broken. So that's why, you know, you're having troubles with your arm. And that's why your, your um, shoulders are always tense. Or I have three herniated discs. So that's why I have back pain and the sciatica is shooting down my legs. And I'm not a doctor. So I would just go, OK, right, let's how are we going to deal with it? So I never thought my pain could go away. I just thought it was something I was going to have to deal with. And then after I finished the One Thought program in London with Aaron Turner, um, and I noticed that all my pain had gone, I, I was fascinated. And at first I didn't make the connection. And then I started thinking, but not only have uh, has my pain gone, I'd actually stopped all the treatments I was trying, like regular chiropractic appointments and massage and you know seeing the doctor and everything. I'd stopped doing it. And I see now, what I believe is that the reason my pain went away, and, and by pain I say I'm including IBS, psoriasis, allergies, asthma, um, you name it, I probably had it at some point. I believe the reason it's all gone away is because my thinking slowed down. You know, as my thinking slowed down, then my nervous system got a chance to slow down and it didn't have to keep sending me those messages anymore. Um, and it's been about, I don't know, seven or eight years now since I came across the principles and I've been pretty much pain free that whole time. I mean, I've had, you know, life stuff happens, you know, I had pneumonia last year, or, you know, which, but it came and went pretty quickly because I'm in a, you know, fairly good state of health and, and mind. Um, I've had, um, you know, I had a minor surgery, but I dealt with it, I got on with it and it didn't turn into anything. See, before it would always turn into something because I'd have the you know, the pulled muscle or the tension in my neck or, or the virus or whatever it was. And then I'd start thinking about it and my thinking would speed up and then I'm ruminating and overthinking and stressing. And the way I understand it works now is that it's like our brains don't speak English, right? They only speak safety and danger. Your brain has one job to keep you alive.
and if is speeded up, it's worrying, it's full of what ifs and anxieties, then the brain is going to think I'm in danger. And then it starts to tighten my muscles. It starts to stop my stomach working properly. It starts to come out through his skin. <clears throat> I remember reading some research once where the doctor, um, a dermatologist said, my patients are weeping through their skin. And I, I, I broke my heart. I thought, oh God, that really explained a lot of what I was experiencing. So what I saw through understanding the three principles, I think, is that I stopped being frightened of my own experience, like, like Sid talks about. I was so nervous that you didn't like me, that I was going to make a mistake, that I was going to do it wrong. And the funny thing is, I never thought I was an anxious person. I just thought those are the right kind of thoughts to have. Right? <laughs> you know, that what is Saturday afternoon for if it's not for to overthink all your problems, right? that's the right thing to do but now I see um you know with this understanding that I was living up in my head and therefore my brain was getting this message that I was in danger all the time even though it wasn't you know like physical danger but just like not knowing scared nervous um and was sending all these physical messages to wake me up and now that I have a fairly good <laughs> grounding and understanding of these principles it just doesn't need to do that anymore and one of the insights I had more recently, which um, I, I really um, I wanted to share with you because it was really profound for me. Well, two, two actually I want to share. So this is a quote from Sid and I, I can never get it into my head. So I'm going to read it. It says, Sid said, the true workings of the mind is not to think, it is to be an open channel to the isness of all things. Now, when I heard that, my mind went boom. <laughs> Right? I suddenly had this, I was actually leading a book club when I when, some, when somebody else actually said the quote and I had to stop for a minute because I'm leading a book club and I had to kind of articulate this insight I'd had whilst they're all watching me. And so the analogy that came to me at first, it's like, it's like this mind that we've been blessed with is, is like a, a Ferrari. Only if I'm full of anxiety, it's like I'm driving this Italian sports car around in first gear, right? That's not what it was designed for, you know? And if in really bad moments, it's just in the driveway and I'm washing and parting. Oh, look, I've got a Ferrari, but I'm not using it for what it was meant for. Sid said, the, mind, the true workings of the mind is not to think, it's to be an open channel to the isness of all things. So if I'm spending my time full of anxiety and stress and worry and overthinking, then it's like I'm misusing this beautiful gift that I've been given. Just imagine, like when your thinking slows down, space opens up creativity and inspiration and intuition and, and solutions to problems that I, I could never have thought of whilst I was caught up in my thinking and, and struggling with the pain. So another analogy I came up for that was like, imagine, imagine you went to the, I don't know, the secondhand store and you, you saw this, I don't know, uh, a vase and you thought, oh, I could just clean that up and put it on my, you know, put it on my table at home. It'd look cute. So you have this vase on your table and you stick pens in it and post-its and, you know, all the, all the junky stuff you have on your kitchen table. And, and then let's say an antique de dealer comes to your house and he's like, oh, geez, my gosh, where did you get that from? And i I don't know, I got it from the junk store. You know? <laughs> and he goes, do you know what that is? You know, and then imagine it's like, I don't know, some Tibetan, you know, like music bowl, or it should be in the Smithsonian Institute or the Victorian Albert Museum or something. And you've been sticking your pens and your post-its in it. You know, it's like, I used my mind like that for so long, innocently, because I didn't understand that my mind is for, um, to say like say creativity and love and kindness and, and intuition and in that better state of mind I can get more done actually more productive and more um, I have better relationships I have better um, better understanding of what's going on I don't take things so seriously anymore I took everything so seriously and I think that's why my body was screaming at me to slow down and then the other insight I wanted to share that's happened more recently is um, one of the phrases um, Dr. Bill Pettit uses a lot and is that we're never broken. And, you know, I, I would share that with clients and I, and I said it with absolute confidence. You know, I, I know that 
you know, I've had my body broken from top to toe and I know that I'm okay. And it's not just a physical thing. It's, it's, it's a, I was, you know, it's a spiritual thing. And then I was, um, I was reading the manuscript. Um, there's a beautiful book by Sheila Massan that came out a couple of years ago. Um, and it's interviews with all the um, three principals, um, teachers and mentors that, that knew Sydney Banks personally. It's, it's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. And Sheila had asked me to read the manuscript and I was reading, I think it was Dickin Bettinger's chapter. And he was talking about um, the formless nature of thought, that thought is this formless energy and then it becomes form and then it moves through to being formless again. And I suddenly thought, oh, that's why we can never be broken because we're the formless energy before it becomes forms into thought because you can't break formless, right? It's so simple once they saw it. That formless energy, and I always start moving my hands around at this point, because I how, how does one explain spiritual energy, right? So we are this formless energy, we're connected to mind through this formless energy. And as that energy passes through my little, you know, screen of consciousness in my little pea brain, it takes some kind of form. Now that form could be um, anxiety, it could be creativity, it could be, you know, analyzing, it could be worry. It's taking some kind of form, including pain. Pain is a physical, you know, um, representation of form that thought can take. And then it moves through and becomes formless again. I, I don't know where it goes up, down, sideways, I don't know where formless energy goes. But whilst it's in form, it feels like it can be broken. Like if I if I were to drop my glass now, it's it's my glass is form and, and it will break on the floor. But imagine smoke, for example, you can't break smoke. It just morphs into another shape, right? Or melts away or something. I don't know where it goes, right? But that's why I can say, not just with confidence now, we're never broken, but now it's, it's so good to understand why it is it cannot be broken because we are that formless energy before thought and to me that's one of the the beauties of you know um i said many blessings of understanding the principles is to see that um we are what's really happening is before the formation of thought it's that connection with mind it's that loving um kindness intelligence wisdom that is already making my heart beat and already making my my um you know if i have a cut it heals you know there's such wisdom in the body to heal itself. But the same mind, universal divine mind, created my, my mind with a system for healing itself too. And I see that now is, I just have to leave it alone. You know, I can still get some stinky thinking. I can still get a funky thought or an inappropriate thought or a criminal thought or even... and. I've just learned to leave it alone and it will just pass through. It's not me. And therefore it doesn't have to um, turn into a physical sensation. It doesn't have to turn into chronic pain where my body is screaming at me anymore. Um, and if I do get a twinge of something, I just know not to feed it or fight it. And it, and it moves on like all those other thoughts. So um, I guess that's what came to me to share. Um, I, uh, I'd love to hear any questions you have. So um, let's see, what should we do next? <laughs> oh, beautiful, thank you, Hannah. So yeah, anyone who has a question or would like to share something, simply unmute yourself and um, go right ahead. <clears throat> Everybody's thinking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anna, I have a question. Please, yeah. So I have a new client. We've had a couple of sessions. I'm a practitioner. Mm -hmm. And she's got a very busy mind. So I'm just taking it slow. And she's had therapy for 20 years and she's still on antidepressants. Mm -hmm. She said to me last time, she said, well, I know it's my hormones, mm -hmm. you know, so um, I know that's the main reason I'm loving our conversations, but I think let's take a break for a few weeks and, and meet in September. 
And I said that, you know, wonderful. And I didn't really know. I think what I would do is when we next talk about that is say, that's one thing, just beware of the layer of thinking you might put on top of that. But I just wonder how you, what you would respond to that, how you would. Yeah, thank, thank you for bringing up the subject of hormones. Um, it's funny, when, when I came across the three principles, that was my first question, because I was just really struggling with menopause at the time. My, um, I was having hot flushes like every 20 minutes. It was hard to function, you know, when you have fever all the time. Um, and my brain fog was so bad. It wasn't just silly things like find may finding mayonnaise in the freezer. You know, it was, I, I couldn't think through something simple that I really knew. Something I've been teaching somebody for years, for example, and I couldn't find the words in my head to, to, to communicate. It was quite distressing. Um, and I remember the very first three principles teacher I spoke to was Dr. Mark Howard. I don't know if you're familiar with him, Lo lovely, kind gentleman. And I remember um, I said to him, I, I get it's my thinking because I've been coaching people for a long time and I, I knew the problem was in my thinking. I said, but what about hormones? Like they're making my temperature go up and down. They're making my mood go up and down. Like get out of that one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I never forget, he kind of went, said no it's still your thinking <laughs> right so I've you know since you know gone I, I think that kind of got me started on the whole mind body thing because I was so curious like what that actually meant so in in my my more recent book um you know I, I used hormones as a um as a kind of a topic to introduce more people to the principles and I chose a woman who was going through menopause her and two daughters so one has postpartum depression and one has pmdd which is a very severe um version of pms month, like the monthly cycle and um so that we can see basically that there are no exceptions i mean that would be my simple answer to your question there are no exceptions when when we say we live in a thought created world 100 percent of the time that includes physical sensations now i'm not saying it's fun to you know have your temperature going up and down or to be in pain or to be dizzy or have migraines or any of any physical symptoms but there's let's say there's a um an organic reason for the physical discomfort like like a you know um, a hormone fluctuation or a fractured ankle or you know or a migraine or something then <clears throat> there's the pain and then there's our thinking about it right so like I was saying is it's my my brain is only speaking the language of safety and danger so if I am having a physical um physical pain or discomfort then I believe that we're given what we need to handle that but my thinking about it is going to escalate it and make it a much much worse experience so whatever the person is dealing with um, in this case, you know, like hormones, then there's a misunderstanding there that the hormones are producing the experience because, it, and it's a tricky question, tricky thing, because yes, they, hormones exist, right? They have a job to do um, and they are making my temperature change. But I can accept with the gift of thought. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, like, let's say you were out walking the dog and you twisted your ankle and you'd probably feel pain straight away um, because the brain senses, it gets messages from all these nerves around your body that there's some damage and the brain actually turns pain on. The pain happens in the brain, not in your ankle. It's a special effect that it feels like it's in your ankle, but it's there to help us and Usually that means take your weight off it, get ice, go to the hospital, whatever it is, you know, common sense tells you what to do. But let's say you're a soldier and you're in combat. I guess you might not feel any pain at all because to stop in that situation could be fatal. And your brain knows that through your five senses, it can tell where you are. And so soldiers often don't feel pain until they're back to the base or hospital in safety. And then they're going to feel it, you know, then the brain turns the pain on 
so they will scream get help you know so you see that pain and when like i said when i say pain i mean sensations dizziness heat you know all kinds of things are turned on and off by the brain and in a low mood i'm going to be more sensitive to that um in fact People with fibromyalgia, for example, their their nervous systems are so hypersensitive that you just give them a hug and they'll scream because their their nervous systems are so revved up. Whereas somebody else, like like say a soldier, could have you know a bullet wound, doesn't even feel it. So it all depends where the nervous system is holding. So I, I just want to tell you a quick bit of research that I, I was minded about recently. Um, and this comes from a book by Deepak Chopra, who's a you know, medical doctor. And he reported on a piece of research where the it was in a university research department and they were testing, you know, had, they have to test on animals. They don't have to, but they do. Um, they tested, they were testing cholesterol levels on rabbits. And so they had different cages of rabbits. They're feeding different levels of cholesterol food. And all of the diets were very heavy. So almost poisonous cholesterol. And as they're collecting the data, they noticed that one cage of animals was not affected by their diet at all. They thought that's weird. So they went and they, they watched the videotape of the research assistants doing the feeding. And they noticed this particular cage, the research assistant would pick the bunny rabbits up and he'd cuddle them and fluff them and, and pet them and put them down and then he would um, feed them, you know, the, the poisonous. But the, the diet was not affecting them because they'd been cuddled and loved. Love is so powerful, right? So, and they recreated this in other universities in other countries and, and they found it was true. It wasn't just a fluke thing that you can recreate this experiment and see how much love is helping the situation so going back to your client if if she is in a better mood a better feeling which that's what you're pointing her to and helping her with then in a lighter frame of mind those hormones can fluctuate normally and naturally and we're not so affected by them and that's been my experience my menopause symptoms pretty much went away um, and that's why i think my pain went away in, in a better state of mind, we just do better. Our bodies respond better. We we handle everything with it e easier, like our, with a sense of humor and lightness. And and if we are in a situation that needs medical attention or you know some you know some other serious attention, common sense will kick in and tell us. You know we can rely on that. It's a reliable system. So yeah, great question. Thank you. Hope that helps. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Somebody else? Well, I also have a question. You mentioned the sensitivity about the fibromyalgia. Uh -huh. And how, how do you work with uh, um, the desensitizing uh, to lower the sensitivity? You mentioned so the love. Is it the love? <laughs> well, love is always the answer, right? That's what people <laughs> said. Um, um, yeah, how to how to help lower that sensitivity. So um, I remember listening to a lecture from a, a doctor who a medical doctor who specialized in this, and he described the nervous system of someone with fibromyalgia. And I think this is true for chronic fatigue syndrome and, and probably long COVID as well. Their nervous systems are he, he equated the nervous system to a, a guitar. So think of an electric guitar. If you have an electric guitar, you can strum it and make some sound with it, even when it's not switched on, right? Because it has strings and they vibrate. You can hear a bit of a noise. But the electric guitar, you plug it into what we call an amplifier. It amplifies the sound, right? And when you strum electric guitar and you turn the volume up, it's going to get louder and louder and louder. You know, and if you're, I don't know, some heavy metal rock band, you might have 60 of those amp amplifiers on the stage and the sound is deafening, right? Um, in fact, I, I don't know, are you, any of you familiar with the movie Spinal Tap? Is anybody old enough to remember that? <laughs> yes, I see two people nodding. So there's that joke in Spinal Tap where they there it was a hobby rock band. It's a, a mockumentary. It's a movie that's supposed to be a documentary about a rock band. And they had special amps made that went up to 11, <laughs> right? Remember that? <laughs> So that's someone with fibromyalgia. Their their amplifier is turned up to eleven. 
you know, past the, the usual um, marks that, that most of us have. So understanding that is a huge part of the situation. Um, I had a one of my first early, earlier on clients um, when I started working with people with physical issues had fibromyalgia. She she'd been suffering for about five years. She had tried everything, you know, meditation and diets, and she'd even trained to do some kind of natural healing um, stuff herself. And I remember when we started working together, she was in so much pain. Um, she could not sit still like this for a session. She'd have to get up and move. She'd lie down. She'd move over here. She. She told me that her husband could not give her a hug. She couldn't go out to a restaurant for a meal because she couldn't sit long enough in a chair to eat a meal. She was in that much pain. And we started working together and um, she just fell in love with the principles. It was it was such a pleasure because, you know, you know some clients just kind of get it and they're, 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 um, they're, it's just such a pleasure to keep pointing them in that direction. And she's, we, we, we did um, quite a few sessions together and she started feeling better. Um, and her, her pain didn't go away like that. I, I, I don't know why, but for some reason, people with fibromyalgia, it seems to take longer and chronic fatigue. I don't know why it just seems to, but she started suffering less. She still had the muscle pains and weakness, but her suffering really went down. See, there's a difference, right? Because of her understanding, she she wasn't focused on the pain all the time anymore. It wasn't like, before I did it, I was the girl with the back pain and, you know, blew mud three times. She was the girl with fibromyalgia and she started becoming a person again and having an interest. And I remember after we finished working together um, in, in that, you know, those one-on-one -on -one sessions, she'd had a dream of traveling to Jamaica for a vacation. She lived in Germany and I think anybody flying from Germany to Miami and then again to Jamaica is going <laughs> to, that's a long flight. And she did it, you know, just a few months after not being able to even sit long enough to eat a meal, she was on a, what was that, 15 hour flight. And she spent three weeks in Jamaica having this dream vacation. Um, and then afterwards, um, she's moved house. She, she does gardening. She goes running. At first, she would have to rest in between. And she just stopped talking about the pain and the pain slowly, slowly, it's been a few years now, but it's, you know, it's slowly gotten better. She just doesn't mention it anymore. It's not on her mind. She may still have some muscle weakness or some muscle, you know, um, uh, fatigue and tiredness, but this understanding took her focus off of it. And so her, her brain and her mind and her body started getting the message she was safe. And the safer she felt, the more she was able to get back into her life and live her life. And, you know, the, for those people, it can be quite protracted. You know, I think the same principles applying whether someone's pain disappears overnight, which can happen, um, or whether it's a few years, it's um, the experience of it is changing. And then the body, the wisdom of the body is, is catching on that we're safe. Like, I did not feel safe most of my life. Not that I was in any physical danger, but this nervous anxiety about whether someone likes me or I'm going to make a mistake, that kind of perfectionist thinking really um, got me very tight and very, um, you know, wound up tight emotionally, <laughs> physically. And then as we start feeling safer in our minds and start relaxing, our, our bodies get the message and, and the nervous system starts to calm down and heal. And then the volume turns down and um, and that sensitivity starts to lessen. And then something else I just thought about sensitivity. One of the other things that I'm realizing even now that I had a quite a big sensitivity to noise. And because my thinking is very much right and wrong and very much the perfectionist thinking, which I found a lot of um, chronic pain people have that kind of perfectionist thinking. Um, Whenever what the noises that used to um, um, ha have the most effect on me were, th were situations that I think are wrong. Like they should not be making that noise. Um, they shouldn't be, you know, leave their car running and fill my house up with, you know, like, uh, cause I've got the windows open, it's summer. Like, like the, they're filling my house up with, with pollution and, you know, it's not right. 
<laughs> and I get all jud judgmental and up in my head. And then the more judgmental I am and the, the more up in my head I am, the more my brain is going to pick up on that sensitivity. And I've gotten to the place where, you know, I want to put my fingers over my ears. Whereas if I was in a better mood or a better state of consciousness, it probably wouldn't bother me that much. I, I see now there's a real connection between my judgmental thinking and the physical reaction I'm having in my sensitivity. Um, and, and as I become less, less judgmental and less, you know, um, I, I was called a, the police, the police once, cause I'm always monitoring what everybody's doing. I got a, a so many things have changed in the last few years, but if you just think of it, if you're hypervigilant, monitoring, supervising everything and everybody, the nervous system is on fire. And as, as we as I retired from the police service and the, the, the monitoring um, committee and all those things in my head and took the uniforms off, then, then my, my, my nervous system calmed down and, and so many of those sensitivities have gone away. And I think that's true for food sensitivities, um, all kinds of allergies, noise sensitivity, and fibromyalgia is like the ultimate um, sensitivity. So was, was any of that helpful? Yes, thank you very much. Especially the the one with noise. It's uh, my one of my, uh, my issues. <laughs> and, and and another question: Do you recommend using um, special kinds of? How could I say? When you have a thought, and your mind is active, and you leave the thought then there will be some quiet some quietness in the in our nature but do you also recommend using active um, some activity to how should i say it um, i've written down a word sorry for my english so you're doing, you're doing great um to practice something to connect uh, further to our nature. Right. In addition to uh, trying to leave the thought alone, to get to, to get, I, I wanted to get to um, this place of um, being closer to nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, isn't that what we all want? That's great. Uh, so it's funny, earlier this year, I I was called a three principles purist by two different people. And I'm not sure it was a compliment, but I've decided to take it as a compliment because I, I don't use any other tools and techniques. I don't combine this with anything. It doesn't make sense to me to do that because I, I don't believe consciousness needs help, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. consciousness and divine mind are are everything you know so they don't really need help i might need help with my grounding with seeing things more clearly getting more clarity we, we're all on a journey of understanding this better and i actually had an insight with this recently um i don't know if you saw uh aaron turner's um course that he did recently he started off with some sessions and then some of the other wonderful um, practitioners carried on. I think it's called Simple Premise. You'll find it on the 3PGC uh, website. And because Aaron and I had talked about this and and because uh, he, he he really helped me see that, you know, being a three principles fundamentalist is, is that it's actually, um, I, I, I'm quite proud of it now. Um, and he said something in that course that really helped me understand this. I think a lot of people come to the three principles and they will have a powerful insight. You know, they'll, they'll have something, they'll go like, wow, you know, I, I get it now, like, that's amazing. And, and they might kind of have a free ride on that for a while and we feel in touch with nature. We feel, we're, we're floating and we're having this, you know, beautiful relationships and, you know, things are going smoothly and, and even like, we're just smelling the roses and every, I love everybody, you know, and then, and then something happens you know, a life thing could happen because life is still going to happen even though we understand the principles. And it could be a relationship thing, a financial thing, a physical thing. And then I, I, 
don't know about you guys, but I, I've had clients come to me and go like, I, you know, I had the principles and I lost it or, or it doesn't work anymore. Or I, now I have to like, I'm going to go and try something else. And, and what Aaron helped me see was just because someone's had a powerful insight, they might not understand how it works. There's a difference. So like an insight is kind of like a freebie, you know, like when you're, I don't know, like a, a, a child tells you that they love you or you see a sunset or something. That's kind of like a freebie. It's, it's, you know, it's easy to feel, feel good in those moments. But we're all going to have life moments that aren't so smooth, aren't so beautiful. They're going to be a bit bumpy. And that's when my, I need my grounding. And my grounding, if I can even just hang on to it, like I might be hanging on to my seat and if something is really, you know, a, a really difficult um, challenge, if I can hang on to the fact that I'm still, even in that moment, experiencing my thinking, that thought is always moving, that underneath whatever is happening, I am okay, that I cannot be broken, like I was talking about, that that it is only love, that love is the answer. Like, like when I feel connected, then I'm, I can hang on to that. I, it's reliable. And i just tell a quick story. Um, I remember, I don't know when this was recorded, but I remember listening to a conversation once between Elsie Spittle and Linda Pransky. So they were talking like girlfriends, like they've known each other forever. And Elsie was telling this story about how her husband was taken ill and I believe he was helicoptered off the island because, you know, where they live on, on uh, Salt Spring Island, there was, there was no hospital there. So he had to be helicoptered to Vancouver General Hospital. And I don't think Elsie could make it. You know, she wasn't allowed in the helicopter, so she had to drive. And during that time she was driving to the hospital, she, I remember her saying she was going in and out of panic, which for me is kind of comforting to hear that even Elsie can <laughs> get panic. Because in a situation like that, that's normal and natural, right? It's very human. Now, I can't remember exactly how she described it, but she said she was going in and out of panic. But even when she was in panic, not knowing what was happening to her husband, she felt held. She, she knew she wasn't going to fall through the floor. And I don't remember her using this analogy, but what always comes into my mind is a soft mattress. That even when I go down, I can all get hurt feelings or, you know, um, you know, get caught up in our thinking. But I have absolute confidence now that there's a soft mattress for me to land on. That's that loving mind connection. And and mattresses bounce, you know? Like kids love to bounce on mattresses. And that that loving bounce, well, I know that I'm gonna come back up again. And it might be five minutes, might be five hours, you know, um, who, who knows what, thank, thank God these days it's, it gets shorter and shorter and it's pretty, pretty sweet. Um, and also when I have difficult situations like that now, I'm almost grateful for them because they remind me how far I've come. And, and I remember Linda on that call, Linda said to Elsie, she said, this is what, I said, Elsie, this is why I love you because you could have the panic without the panic having you. And Elsie said, yes, I could have the experience without the experience having me. And I thought, you can have pain without the pain having you. And I found that so healing and comforting. And so when we take our grounding with us into those difficult situations, whether it's a physical one or an emotional one, then, <clears throat> then it's kind of like a life jacket. You know, if, if you're drowning, and you're given a life jacket, there's a way out. There is always a way out with this understanding, whatever the situation is. So hanging on to that grounding, I don't need any tools and techniques anymore. Because um, I've learned to kind of see the, the warning signs as it were. And for me, it's uh, a lot of physical stuff happens when I, if I get caught up in my thinking. Other people, it can be speedy thinking, it can be, um, you know, urgency, or, or we lose our tempers, we lose our sense of humor. Whatever it is, whatever those signals are for you that you're heading down, um, that awareness helps us not to go all the way to the bottom anymore, where we're struggling and nothing makes sense, you know. So does, does that, is that helpful? Yes, I think that's helpful. I'm very new to the principles, so I think I still need some 
extra tools. <laughs> uh, so did, did you hear what you just said? You said, I think I need some extra tools. Yes. What, what, what's that book go by, right? I mean, I'll I tell you, what, what I feel about tools and techniques now is like, um, you know, when a little kid is learning to ride a bicycle, like in, in England, we used to call them stabilizers, like little wheels, extra yes. wheels, right? In America, they call them training wheels, right? So when a little kid is learning to ride a bicycle, they need help, right? They're going to wobble and fall off, maybe break their arm. And when you've wobbled and fallen off a few times, you, you know, like you, those wheels stop you, you know, or maybe a kind adult hold, holding the seat for you. But when we understand how to ride a bike, you don't need them anymore, mm. right? So all those tools and techniques, I, I, I was innocently using them before because I didn't understand how my mind worked. I didn't understand how experience is created. But once you understand it, you've, you've had a few insights and then you're understanding how that insight even worked, how, you know, where to look for a new insight, which has baffled me for a while. Um, I, I now know it's probably in the unknown somewhere, which is the unknown is the worst place for a perfectionist. Uh, if you're a control freak, <laughs> The unknown is frightening, but I now see it as an adventure, you know, like learning to ride a bicycle. And when I bring my humor and, and my, um, my goodwill and good feelings into it, and I know from previous experiences that I'm going to be taken care of, it's not so scary anymore. Even new things. I used to be terrified of something new, terrified of new places or new people. I would go, but I'm hating it. <laughs> And, and it's so funny I, I've only recently in the last couple of years you know having been with the principals for a while started strategy I, I didn't know it was anxiety because I thought I was right you know <laughs> so, but when you overthink something and now you've got a migraine or your stomach's hurting then you know that's that's a clue that we we've gone up in our heads so the more you can be present in the moment and trust mind and trust that you'll be given what you need. I think trust is, you know, um, highly underrated. It, it gets you out of a lot of situations. So you were gonna say something else? I, I got a thought about it's me having to have faith in it's enough. I don't have to do or lose tools that have been done before mm. I think it's pushing me yeah to let go I want to give you a big hug right now and it's so scary but you're safe and I think it's just I know it's a thought There's, there's a safety and a love and, and like that soft mattress that's going to catch you. You are that formless, you're going to make me cry. Um, <laughs> that, for, that beautiful formless energy, that's who you are. That's why we can't be broken. You know, all the hurt, the heartbreak, you know, all, all those terrible feelings that I used to be drowning in for so many years. I now see it was innocent. I, I would have done better if I'd known better. Mm -hmm. You know, the mistakes I made, the, the stress and the anxiety that, that put my body through all kinds of hell. It was an innocent misunderstanding. And there's so much love and kindness and wisdom just waiting to scoop you up now. That mm -hmm. <laughs> you, yes. cannot, you cannot be... Even feeling alone is a state of mind. Safety is a state of mind. It's all made of mm. I I really thank you for sharing your your vulnerability and you know I'm I'm just, I'm, I'm sending big hugs down the airwaves. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mo. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Hannah, could I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I think 
a few minutes ago you, you were you were talking about different things that uh, uh, like fibromyalgia and you happened to mention the word food so I have my I my youngest son is uh, he's got a an, an allergy reaction to peanuts and shellfish mm-hmm. and uh, he can get quite ill he had a he had an incident uh, in Italy a few weeks ago he plays in a band and uh, the uh, the the writer uh, uh, for the band stipulated there should be absolutely no contamination with uh, peanuts and unfortunately in one item of food there was unbeknownst to anyone and he he uh, basically collapsed they had to be hospitalized out but he's okay now mm-hmm. but it was uh, quite a severe reaction and was very frightening it's happened to him before I was just wondering about does that sensitivity include allergic reaction or is there any connection in your thinking it's a, it's a good question and I think it's an important one too like so as you know I'm not a doctor so I can only share with yeah, well, you. of course yeah but um what I've what I've seen um I think there are there's there's a difference between sensitivities and, and allergies um and I'm not sure the exact te- technical definitions or, or or description of those so I don't I don't want to get too much into the technical stuff but I can tell you that um, bodies are weird and wonderful. And I, I, for example, am allergic to penicillin. Now, I don't believe that's my thinking. It's just what my body does. Like it, it, it makes brown hair, it digests my lunch, you know, my body does stuff, right? Um, and I had, a, I had penicillin, I don't know, back in when I lived in Los Angeles, um, years before the principles and ended up in the emergency room, you know, like your son, you know, couldn't breathe. I I remember I woke up, I couldn't breathe. And I looked in the mirror. It was like Rocky three. My my face was swollen and and like skin was flaking and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't breathe. So, you know, got to the emergency room. And I remember talking to the emergency room doctor and I said, I must've had penicillin before. Like, I'm sure I got it as a kid, you know, for earache or, you know, but all kids get given penicillin at some point. And he said to me, um, he said, in my 30 years as an emergency room doctor, he said, the most predictable things about allergic reactions is that they are unpredictable. So that was one thing. And because I was never sure if that was really true, I volunteered to have a, um, it tested a couple of years ago. So there's a, a the allergy department at the hospital where I live now. And because being allergic to penicillin is, is you know, it's tricky because, you know, you might need it um like like with your son with the with the peanuts you, you have to take care of these things so i i had i was tested in a controlled environment and they confirmed yes i am i'm definitely allergic to penicillin good information so now on all my charts everywhere in big red sharpie it says you know allergic to penicillin and and that's common sense you know like what, what your son is doing is common sense to take care of himself i think there's a big difference between that and the kind of recent um upsurge in uh food allergies that is happening all around the world right now i i am i've talked to a lot of people who um talking about histamine um reactions and i've had clients too who um you know are suffering so bad with food allergies that they they can only eat like a three two, two or three things they're down to like you know grilled chicken and water and i, I remember meeting one woman and she said but i'm allergic to water I'm like, how can you be allergic to water? <laughs> We're made of water. You know, there, yeah. I don't know what percentage is, but like there's like eighty percent of us is water. I, so I see that as you know, most of those food um, allergies or sensitivities. I, I, I'd say I'm, I can't remember which way around it is, but um, those I'd say sensitivities are coming from stress. They are a stress reaction. So that's what I'm saying. I think there's a difference between a stress reaction that for those people is coming out in a food allergy, like, you know, um, people in their skin or stomachs or, um, and something like me with penicillin or your son with the peanuts is a uh, organic thing. I, I might be wrong and any doctors listening, they can uh, please correct me. Um, but going back to what I said at the beginning of the call, there's the, allergic reaction whether it's organic or mind body stress related and then there's our thinking about it 
Mm. So let's say your son, you know, that it accidentally consumes the, the you know, peanuts. If he then panics, it's going to make the situation a thousand times worse and can be, you know, very serious. So, I, and I've learned this from um, working with people with flashbacks, for example. You know, someone who has PTSD and, and some people you know, can continue to have flashbacks. I know people who are having flashbacks and they've learned not to feed it or fight it. Mm. And then it only takes what, I think about three minutes for a flashback to physically go through your system and then it's over. Whereas if you panic, you could be ending up in the emergency room, you know, have, people think you're having a heart attack, they're pumping you full of all kinds of drugs and, and now you're, you know, like being admitted to a hospital or a care unit when it could have been over in three minutes. Mm. So mm. all I would say with your son, it seems like it, it would appear that an organic thing, um, but the, the less reactive he is to it, the more he's comfortable living his life, you know, without overthinking it. And I wouldn't be surprised if the even the reactivity of the allergic reaction could get less severe too. I wouldn't be surprised if, because okay. if, um, I, I know the calmer I am, the my allergies disappear. Um, I I'm I was I had allergies for fifty years with um, grass pollen and cedar, and I'm, I'm allergic to olive trees. And I live in Israel now. You can't go for more than. <laughs> feet without bumping into a, an olive tree and I'm not sneezing my allergies have gone away um but my allergy to penicillin hasn't so there there, there are differences and um you know so common sense tells us to get medical attention and then there's our thinking about it and that's what we have you know in, insight and a grounding to help us with so yeah thank you, thank you. That's good. Welcome. yeah so Justina we are we good on time? We are. We are. Thank you, Hannah, for this yeah, very informative and wonderful conversation. Um, there's certainly some things that I'm going to take away and reflect on. Yeah, and I want to thank um, everyone who has joined us for this conversation, your presence, and um, for participating and making it a rich discussion. It's been really wonderful. I look forward to seeing some of you again. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.